coming up on the Q30 newscast. See how the town of Hamden is celebrating Sleeping Giant State Park's 100th anniversary. Fall Fest returned to campus this weekend with the 502's headlining. And see how the game design program is preparing students for life outside of college. Also see how local eatery is celebrating Hamden Restaurant Week. All of that and more coming up on the Q30 newscast. Welcome to Studio 125 for this evening's edition of the Q30 Newscast. My name is Andrew Allison and I'm joined alongside Ben Rickavicious. We have a lot to cover tonight, Andrew, but we start tonight with breaking news. At approximately 9 p.m., Hamden Police and Quinnipiac Public Safety were present outside the School of Communications, Computing and Engineering. According to the University Public Relations, John Morgan, police and public safety were responding to a medical emergency. At, their, at this time, there is no information. For updates, keep with Q30 News. Last week, Sleeping Giant National Park celebrated its 100th anniversary. Q30's Ashley Potvin has a story. Sleeping Giant State Park across from Quinnipiac University recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. Sleeping Giant Park Association and surrounding community members held an event this past Saturday to honor this historical day. SGPA President Louis Arana spoke about the event and what occurred throughout the day. We had a big celebration here uh, and we had um, guided hikes uh, there were four of them, and we had Rhythm Doctors, um, a group from uh, Quinnipiac University, a faculty member, performed here. The Legends, also from Quinnipiac, also performed here. Uh, we even worked with Counterweight Brewing Company, uh, and they brewed a special edition of beer called Sleeping Giant Centennial. We had food trucks, we had tables set up for different um, conservation organizations and other nonprofits that deal with nature. Arada also gave insight on how Sleeping Giant State Park fosters to everyone. Everybody can come to the park. So this is a public park and uh, there are over almost 40 miles of backward trails and we are the ones who do that. Um, a band of volunteers who go out there and keep the trails open so that people can go in any direction they want on the mountain and enjoy it. After a tornado hit in May of 2018, many thought the park to be destroyed but members of SGPA gathered together to restore its beauty. I can't believe that a band of volunteers was able to reopen the trails after the tornado, uh, and uh, we did it in, in six months. Uh, we, as I said, all volunteers, we got uh, safety training, the use of chainsaws and other equipment, and we went out there until the trails were reopened. That an organization, volunteer organization, can do that, it's amazing. To learn more about upcoming events in the association itself, be sure to visit sgpa.org. Reporting from Sleeping Giant State Park for Q30 News, I'm Ashley Potvin. On Monday, the Indigenous Student Union partnered with the Student Government Association to offer a workshop for students in celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day. The event was held in the Student Center Piazza, and participants were invited to think about the Indigenous connections to Quinnipiac's name. It included an interactive presentation covering the history of Connecticut Indigenous groups, including real artifacts from Indigenous tribes. As a university called Quinnipiac, carrying an indigenous name, um, it's really important that we provide all students, regardless of their areas of interest, regardless of their field of study, uh, get exposed to this information. The DEIA Pillar and Survivor Advocacy Alliance hosted an informative event about domestic violence awareness on October 15th. The event informed students about domestic violence prevention and what healthy and unhealthy relationship indicators are in order to help build a safer community. Lily Phillipsack, a political science major, served as the main speaker and contact point, and she shared a few tips to help survivors. It's also important to know the resources available to you and them. Yes, you want to get them the support that they need and do whatever they can, but you also have to take care of yourself. School of Communications alumni Eric Marapati visited campus this Friday. The visit is part of the Office of Inclusive Excellence's Critical Conversation Speaker Series. In his return to Quinnipiac, Mara Potty will be speaking on the upcoming election cycle and the news media's responsibility in covering it. He will also share his insights on the journey from Quinnipiac to a national platform and discussing the evolving landscape of journalism. This past weekend, SPB and WQAQ held its annual Fall Fest on the Mount Carmel campus quad. 
Q30's Carter Kane has more on the festivities. On Saturday, October 12th, the Quinnipiac Mount Carmel Quad was filled with nothing but good vibes, happy fans singing along, and the 502s, an indie band from Maitland, Florida, whose sound is a combination of roots, rock, and bluegrass to make a, quote, folk orchestra. Q30 had the chance to talk to some students and ask them about the festival. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun so far. I mean, I wasn't that familiar with the 502s before today, but... They've been pretty cool. I mean, I've gotten pretty up close with them. The SPB and WQAQ printed out posters with all the information about the event. Besides the live entertainment, students were able to enjoy an inflatable obstacle course, a mechanical pumpkin, and food from multiple food trucks. Students also had the opportunity to go on a scavenger hunt as well. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a really great turnout. Um, I have worked on this event since I was a sophomore and now I'm a grad student. Um, so just getting to see how it changes from year to year is really awesome. I think we have a great artist. I think a lot of people are just sitting and enjoying everything. And that's what makes this whole process worth it, is just to see people enjoying it. Students enjoyed Fall Fest 2024 and are very eager to see how the SPB and WQAQ top it with next year's event. Reporting from the Mount Carmel Quad, for Q30 News, Carter Kane. On Tuesday, the Student Government Association held its first town hall of the semester. The topic was campus and safety emergency procedures. Quinnipiac's Tony Reyes, Keith Woodward, and John Morgan all spoke during the event. Public safety's response to the pipe bomb threat was reviewed, and there was a discussion of the university's future plans in regarding to emergency situations. SGA also opened the floor for students to ask questions. I think what I'm hoping that comes out is increase participation, increase um, buy-in into um, community responsibility in terms of uh, the overall safety and overall just better relationships between our students and, and our public safety officials. Award-winning broadcaster from New York City, Ernie Anastos, visited campus this Tuesday. Anastos, one of New York's most influential journalists, brought his wealth of knowledge and inspiration to a Q&A at the CCE Open Air Studio. He discussed his broadcasting career and experience in the news media industry with attending students. You're unique. So think about your gift, use it the best you can, and be something very special. You'll be proud of yourself for doing it, and so will everybody else. An information session about a Connecticut legislative intern program was held in the Carl Hansen Student Center on Monday afternoon. Students had the opportunity to work 18 hours a week in the CT General Assembly and can earn six credits. Some of the experience the program offers are observing legislators, working with aides, and completing academic research. In addition to the school credits, the internship also offers students a great networking and professional development opportunity. The deadline for applying for the internship is October 31st. Ben, pumpkin spice season is upon us, and that means it's starting to get a bit chilly. Andrew, I'm not a big pumpkin spice guy, but I do enjoy the cooler weather. It's time to check in with Connor Corp, who will tell us if I need to break out my vest this weekend. Yeah, Ben, you might have to today and tomorrow, but head, as we head into the later parts of this week, you may need to take off that vest and almost go into a short, short sleeve shirt, excuse me. You know, we head into the today and tomorrow, 55 and 57, but as we head into Friday, it's going to be up in the 60s again, 64 degrees. That could be a good sign as we head into the later parts of next week. All the full seven-day forecast in the map of Connecticut after this quick commercial break. My name's Stacy, I'm 57, and I was adopted in 2020. One teen can come in and, and make you look at life in a whole different way. You know, he's my father, so I look up to him a lot. If I can be 10% of the man he is, I'll be a happy person for sure. Learn about adopting a teen from foster care. You can't imagine the reward. Visit AdoptUSKids.org. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. 
They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. Welcome back to the Q30 Newscast. The Game Design and Development Program is helping students gain real-world experience in game design and promotion. Q30's Emily Katz has more. Real-world experience is something students in the Game Design and Development Program are living with after their four years. In this program, students are exposed to programming, interactive media design, hands-on experience, and internships. The director of the program, Elena Bertazzi, spoke on its goals. It's a very hands-on program. Students learn how to do all the things they need to know how to do in the game industry and that includes publishing games and then hopefully marketing them. Students even have opportunities to showcase their designs annually. Every year all of our students present their work at a final showcase. There's a whole section where you can play any of these games so all of these games are there to play. We have um, external judges who come in and judge on best art, best sound, best narrative, best gameplay. The department recognized that there were few opportunities for students outside the program to see the hard work of these designers. And so the newest addition to Tater Hall was added, student game design posters. We wanted to really showcase what our students do and let other people outside of our program know how good they are. These displays feature current and past games developed within the program. Anyone can scan their QR codes to download and test the games. James, a current student, with the support of the program, his personal game has progressed into its far stages of development. It's going to be going to PAX. We have our independent study with that game where we're going to be working on it like a part-time yes. job. And none of this would have been possible if it weren't for this program. James' story is one of many, from showcases, internships, to an actual arcade machine in Tato Hall made just for student published games. There are many opportunities. The future of this program is promising, with new majors to be added and future internships to be opened. The main focus remaining on preparing students for a future career in the industry. The Game Development and Design program is helping students make waves in the game industry. Make sure to check out this game right here. Reporting from Tato Hall, I'm Emily Katz, Q30 News. Student Health Services is hosting four flu shot clinics at their Mount Carmel and York Hill campus locations over the next month. The locations and dates include October 10th, 24th, and 28th on the Mount Carmel campus and October 17th on the York Hill campus. With Halloween approaching, pumpkin carving season is upon us. Hartford Healthcare and CT Orthopedic Institution hosted their annual pumpkin carving event on the quad. The event gave Hartford Healthcare surgeons and Quinnipiac students the chance to come together to celebrate the fall season. The event started at 5 p.m. today and lasted for about two hours. This marks the third year the event has run. It's election season, which means that there's a lot going on in the political sphere. With races heating up, it's time to check in with Spencer Decker for our weekly update on politics. Here's what's going on in the nation's capital. Starting off in the campaign trails, Vice President Kamala Harris just rallied in Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie County has heavy implications on Pennsylvania results because it is a swing state. Dr. Joe Morris of Mercyhurst University said, quote, in the last 25 elections, 23 times Erie has voted with the winner in statewide elections, end quote, showing how important Erie is to win. Both candidates realize how big it will be to win the battleground states, which includes Georgia, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Moving south to our border, former President Donald Trump has recently received an endorsement. The official account of the U.S. Border Patrol Union announced on X that, quote, on behalf of the 16,000 men and women represented by the National Border Patrol Council, we strongly support and endorse Donald J. Trump for President of the United States, end quote. People from the Border Patrol Union spoke at a rally in Arizona about one of the key issues that Americans have, the border security. This endorsement will certainly help Donald Trump in that stance. Moving north, as both candidates have been debating over to hurricane relief, Former President Donald Trump has been accusing FEMA of not giving proper relief due to the government spending too much money on the current war. Both Kamala Harris and President Joe Biden have denied these claims. Biden said, quote, Over the last few weeks, there has been a reckless, irresponsible, and relentless promotion of disinformation and outright lies that have been disturbing people, end quote. FEMA is still searching for the 92 people missing in North Carolina after Herlene's rampage last week. Now, back to you guys on the desk. Andrew, it's time for our second break of the night, but we still have so much more news to cover. When we return, we've got more on the Quinnipiac Career Fair happening this weekend, and Julia Barcello joins us for a finance update. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back in 90. Owen, when you came into my life, it was a whirlwind. I just can't do it. We didn't know what the future would hold. 
but we knew you would always be a part of it. Adopting you was the best decision in our life. And I am so proud to call you my son. I tell my son, I love you every single day. Now my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. Welcome back to the Q3 Newscast. Ben, we already heard about the three-day forecast, but I'm curious about what the weather has in store for us for the rest of the week. Connor Core is back with the rest of his weather update. Connor, what's in store for us? Yeah, Ben and Andrew, I know we talked about in the three-day tease that it's, temperatures are going to start increasing in the high 50s, even the low 60s. But as we head into later of the week, not only are we going to get back into the 70s, but it's also gonna not, not going to see a cloud in sight. As we look here at the full seven-day forecast, it's like we mentioned, sunny throughout the rest of the week. And getting up into the 60s and the low to even mid-70s as we head into the later parts of the week. But as come nightfall, it's going to drop down into those mid to low and high 40s, really 40s across the board, except tonight and tomorrow. As we look at the Connecticut map around the entire state for tomorrow, you see clouds over in New London and Norwich on the eastern side of the state. But Hartford over to the west, pretty much sunny skies day and night. In the, around the state of Connecticut, multiple towns, it, you'll see it in the mid to low 60s. And get it once again dropping down into that 40 degree zone. So very great weather coming up in the later parts of October. And Ben, like we mentioned earlier, you might not need the vest heading for the rest of the week. We'll send it back to you guys at the desk. We have breaking news out of Buenos Aires, where former One Direction member Liam Payne was found dead, according to local media reports. It was reported that Payne fell from the third floor of his hotel room. Payne was also known for his time as a competitor on The X Factor and selling over 70 million records with hit boy band One Direction. Payne was open about his struggles with drinking and suicidal thoughts, announcing last year that he was three months sober. The English singer was 31 years old. We've already covered weather and politics. Now it's time for an update on national news. Patrick Walls is here to give us live. We're here with us live to give us the news. Patrick. Thanks guys. We're going to start off in New York, where Sean Diddy Combs is facing even more lawsuits for alleged sexual misconduct. Six complaints were filed in the Southern District of New York on behalf of four men and two women for incidents that span from 1995 to 2021. One man alleged that he was sexually assaulted by Combs at one of his infamous white parties in the Hamptons. Another said he was assaulted in a Manhattan department store. Combs is awaiting trial on federal racketeering and sex trafficking charges. He is currently behind bars at the Metropolitan Detention Center in New York City. Moving down the East Coast, a North Carolina man was arrested after threatening FEMA workers assisting in relief from Hurricane Aline. The man was charged with, quote, going armed to the terror of the public, according to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office. Deputies investigated reports about a white male with an assault rifle making comments about harming FEMA workers. Re recovery continues in North Carolina after Hurricane Aline caused widespread flooding, with 95 people having died as a result of the storm. Finally, a New Jersey transit train hit a fallen tree Monday, killing the operator and injuring 23 others. The incident unfolded just after 6 a.m. The light rail train was heading south from Trenton when it struck the tree. There were 42 passengers on the train. All those not injured were taken to their destinations by bus. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy released a statement on X saying, quote, an investigation is underway. Our prayers are with all affected by this tragic incident, end quote. That's all from around the nation this week. Ben, Andrew, I'll send it back to you. This afternoon, there was a university-wide career fair in the Recreation and Wellness Center. Students were able to connect with po potential employers to learn about future internship and job opportunities. In addition to talking with employers, students had the chance to talk with admission representatives and receive advice on applying to graduate programs. Furthermore, students could get professional headshots. 
The fair started at 1.30 p.m. and lasted for three hours. Ben, we've already hit politics, national news, and even some weather. What else do we need to hear about tonight? How about a finance update? Q30's Julia Barcello is here to give us some insight into the current financial landscape. Hi, Ben and Andrew. Starting in Florida, Hurricanes Helene and Milton have destroyed businesses across the state. The Small Business Administration has run out of money for its disaster assistance loans. In a press release, the SBA said, quote, until Congress appropriates additional funds, the SBA is pausing new loan offers for its direct low interest long term loans to disaster survivors. While loans will not be given, the agency says applicant portal is still open and disaster survivors should start the application process so they can receive aid when the SBA receives funding. Since Hurricanes Helene and Milton, the SBA has received around 49,000 applications for relief. The SBA has made over 700 Helene loan offerings, totaling at about $48 million. Now Boeing's finances have become multi-billion dollar problems for the company. In mid-September, 33,000 Boeing mechanists went on strike against the company, demanding a 40% wage increase spread over four years. Because of this strike, Boeing won't be able to deliver all of their planes. This may have an impact on the number of seats available on current flights. With fewer seats available, airlines will have to raise their prices. Since Boeing's crash in 2018 and 2019, the company has reported more than $33 billion in operating losses. The strike in September is adding $1 billion in losses every month. Because of these losses, Boeing is looking to raise $25 billion through additional borrowing, along with the sale of stocks. It is also planning to cut 10% of staff worldwide. Boeing will be able to sustain themselves as a company, however, they are in a position where they need to ensure this is possible. Ben and Andrew, how do you guys feel about flying knowing what's been going on with Boeing? Ben, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it's definitely a little concerning. I think I just, when it comes to thinking about flights in the future, just got to be precautious. Andrew, we've already touched on many stories tonight, but we haven't heard about my favorite topic of the night yet. Don't worry, Ben. When we return, we'll get our sports fix for the night and hear about a new dinosaur discovery. We'll be right back. Have you ever helped a fellow veteran? Of course. Yes. Have you ever asked for help yourself? Uh, it's always tough, right? I always feel like I can solve my own problems, but eventually, you know, you just can't deal with it on your own. And you start to question, maybe people would be better off without me. When you realize that you're not alone, once you take that first step, there's so much support. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. Or what? My. Oh. Meet the scan, a simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. I'm here to save you. But I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at SavedByTheScan.org. Welcome back to Newscast. Ice hockey season returns to the bank. Are you excited? Because I sure am. You bet. Although he's only skated once in his life, Nick Boyd is in the house to tell us all the latest about Quinnipiac sports. Yeah, don't trust me on the ice, guys, but it has been another great week for Quinnipiac Athletics. The men's ice hockey team began their 2024-25 regular season on Saturday with a thrilling 3-2 win over Penn State. Junior Jeremy Wilmer, who transferred in from Boston University, scored two of the three goals in the first two periods, allowing the Bobcats to be up 3-0 going into the third. However, Penn State stormed back in that third period, scoring two quick goals to make it a one-goal game, but the Bobcats' defense held on for the 3-2 win. The team will travel to the University of Maine for, for two top-ten matchups this weekend. 
Staying on the ice, the women's ice hockey team traveled to take on the Providence Friars on Tuesday. The Bobcats beat the Friars at home last week and were hoping to get the season sweep, but gave up three straight goals in the second and third periods and lost 3-2. to two. Graduate student Kendall Cooper scored her second goal of the season in the first period. The teams traded goals in the second period, but Providence came back and scored twice in the third to win the game, handing the Bobcats their second loss of the year. The Bobcats returned to M&T Bank Arena to take on Syracuse University on Friday and Saturday for a two-game series. Lastly, the women's soccer team took on Merrimack earlier this afternoon here in Hamden. And the Bobcats dominated once again, crushing Merrimack, Merrimack excuse me, 5-0. Senior midfielder Rachel Roman recorded her first career hat trick. She scored her third goal on a penalty kick with only three minutes to play. Graduate goalkeeper Sofia Lospinoso made six saves for the Bobcats. It's the team's 10th straight shutout win. They haven't allowed a goal since August 29th. That's all for Quinnipiac Sports this week. Back to Andrew and Ben at the desk. Andrew, even though dinosaurs have been extinct for a very long time, that doesn't mean we still don't discover new things about them today. A team of paleontologists found a 75-foot-long skeleton. The scientists have named the newly discovered skeleton Natalie at a site in Utah, and it has some very interesting features. The gigantic dinosaur is almost twice the size of a city bus and has unique green bones. It was nicknamed Natalie with a G for the stinging gnats that pestered the excavators who worked to unearth its bones. The prehistoric herbivore will be moved, to be moved to and displayed at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Enchiladas is a popular restaurant spot in the Hammond community to grab a bite to eat. Q30's Sydney Weimer has more about the restaurant and perks that Quinnipiac students can enjoy this restaurant week. If you are looking for an excuse to get off campus and enjoy some great food, the town has some good news because starting this past Monday, Hamden has been celebrating its annual restaurant week. Restaurant Week is a yearly event where eateries in the area can choose to participate in special week-long deals for customers, such as buy one get one, fixed multi-course pricing options, and featured key items. From now until October 19th, various restaurants throughout the town participate in the event, but a well-known local Mexican eatery called Enchiladas happens to be featured in this year's lineup. Enchiladas has been here since 1996. I started working here in 1998, so I've been here for pretty long time. Yeah. We participate in Restaurant Week whenever the Chamber of Commerce asks us to do that. Uh, for this week we have a lunch special which includes an appetizer, an entree and a dessert and then we do the same for dinner. Enchiladas, or better known to some as Anchis, will be offering special menu items for the public to enjoy this year as part of their Restaurant Week involvement. So for the appetizers you can do egg rolls, you can do taquitos dorados and then the street corn. And for entrees, you can do street tacos, a salad, and a quesadilla. And for dessert, a flan, a brownie special, or a fried cheesecake. Taking advantage of Hamden's Restaurant Week is something strongly encouraged by businesses, as the event not only offers key items, but promotion for the eateries themselves. More people go out during Restaurant Week, whether it's Hartford County, New Haven County, here in Hamden, people, people are into it. Enchiladas is one of many establishments participating in Restaurant Week this year. For more information on the others involved, be sure to visit ctrestaurantweek.com. Reporting from Enchiladas Mexican Eatery, for Q30 News, I'm Sydney Weimer. Now, Andrew, I've never been to Enchiladas, but you have a few times. Have you enjoyed yeah, it? Yeah, I've been multiple times, and honestly, the food is great. I'm surprised you haven't been, considering it's a pretty iconic restaurant around here. But if I should, go sometime you, soon, what should I order? Ooh, I think last time I got the Enchiladas. And they were really, really good. Any I enjoyed other, those. Any other good restaurants around the area that you uh, I'm still new at Quinnipiac. Yeah. So I don't really have any picks, but... I think if I had to suggest one to you, I'd go with Eli's on Whitney's. It's just a fan classic. A bunch of people in the Quinnipiac community love it. It's to die for. Is that a pizza place? Uh, a little bit of both. It's got pizza, and then there's also like a restaurant with Italian food. It's pretty good overall. That sounds yeah. really good. Uh, but that's all the time we have tonight on the Q30 Newscast. Be sure to stay up to date on everything Quinnipiac News on our website, q30tv.com, and on Q30 Television's social media. Thank you to all the producers and people working hard behind the scenes. My name is Ben Kavicious, and this is Andrew Allison. Have a good night, Bobcat Nation.